Hello and welcome to Conservation Conversations with me, Sarah Mohan. Today we'll be speaking with Dr. Ulas Karanth of the Wildlife Conservation Society and we'll be discussing the role of science and passion in conservation. Dr. Karanth, you've been a strong proponent of the role of science in conservation um, and yet there are many wildlife managers in India who'd say there's no need for any research, just uh, protect nature, just protect the forests and the wildlife and nature will take care of itself. What are your comments to that? It's not just wildlife managers, many people have this view that uh, don't meddle with nature, leave it alone. In some sense it is true when nature covered all of the world and we human beings had not started intervening with it, that was probably true. But a million years ago, we invented fire. Ten thousand years ago, we invented agriculture and farming and livestock raising. So, ever since then, we have been meddling with nature. And today, natural areas where we are trying to protect endangered species have shrunk to just less than 4% of the land in India. So when you have cut, fragmented, chopped and turned nature into pieces, it's really necessary to understand the consequences of all this. So to understand what, what we have done to nature and what's going on inside these fragments that are remnants of old vast nature, we need, we need science. But conservation in India is a lot of the time based on emotion rather than science. So how much weight would you give to emotion, passion and science when it comes to achieving the conservation outcomes in this country? I think uh, both are necessary. I, I would put emotion and passion in one basket and objective science in the other basket and I think both are necessary. Uh, because if you don't have that emotional commitment, if you don't have that passion, why should I care? We can have it all paved over and probably still survive. But that commitment is necessary. But having changed nature, meddled with it, continuing to do things, trying to balance development with conservation, that's where the role of science comes in. Because if you go just based on emotion, you often don't achieve conservation. You may end up, you know, doing things that favor a very common species and lose species that are valuable. So you need this balance between emotion and also objectively understanding what's going on. So now, how much of a role have wildlife scientists in India played in furthering the cause of conservation? Wildlife science per se doesn't have a long history in India. Even as far as early 80s were concerned, there were no trained wildlife scientists, almost none. Even today I would say there are probably less than a hundred well-trained wildlife scientists. So expecting them to play a huge role in the last 20, 30 years is perhaps not right. Uh, but I think in future as we face all these problems and try to balance conservation and development, try to save wildlife, their role becomes crucial. But a wildlife scientist has to be trained properly. It's not just someone calls himself a scientist. He needs to have the credentials, the training and the knowledge. Then it's useful. So in the future, what would you like to see wildlife scientists do? I would like wildlife scientists, number one, for them to be a little more committed. Committed in the sense that sometimes wildlife scientists get lost in their own world of interesting questions. And that's legitimate. But at least some of that science has to go to saving species because while we are ex getting excited about some details of how something evolved or what's the evolutionary reason for some phenomena, uh, we are losing species. So I think this disconnect between practicing science and practicing conservationists has to be bridged. And the scientists have a role in reaching out also. It's not that the practitioners have to come to them. Scientists have to try to reach the public through writing, popular writing, uh, connecting with the um, activists and things of this nature. Right. Now, wildlife managers in India often complain that research done by independent scientists have little relevance for them when it comes to managing protected areas and wildlife. Um, how would you address these complaints? I think that complaint has absolutely no basis in my opinion because 
wildlife scientists may be asking a question in some cases at least that may not be relevant to the manager's domain. If someone's asking an evolutionary question, it may not be relevant to the manager's domain. But much of what has happened, even in the short span that wildlife sciences exist in India, whether development of counting techniques, uh, questions about diet, home ranges of tigers, uh, behavior of animals, all this has been immensely useful to managers. The question is, managers have to be sufficiently trained to understand and absorb this science into their planning and management. In fact, the way it works in the West is managers often go with problems to scientists and say, look, I have this problem. How can we use science to solve it? That rarely happens in India. People just say, oh, we don't get any help from scientists. You have to articulate what is it that you want to know. And you have to, again, think hard how what you want to know is useful for management. I don't see that connect between managers and scientists is good and simply complaining doesn't help. So how does one deal with the pseudoscience that seems to have crept in among wildlife managers today? Everyone seems to reel off terms like uh, blind transect surveys, camera trapping, sampling, so on and so forth. See, what has happened is it's not just not managers. It's also amateur naturalists. It's journalists. A wide section of the society is exposed to these words and they're using it without understanding what that concept is. For example, line transect. People say we did line transect. Line transect sampling is a serious scientific method. You have to have a survey design, you have to have certain randomness to placement of transects, they have to be straight, there's a certain way of doing it in the field. None of this is done. People just, 10 people go for a long walk with the tiffin carriers, chatting along, doing what they want and then they call it a line transect. But this is not special to managers. This is a wider problem because people use buzzwords without understanding what they mean. It needs to be fixed. And how would you, how, how do you handle that then? How can we fix it or is there a way even? People have to be interested in getting it fixed. Secondly, scientists have to reach out and explain some of these things, at least the simpler things in a language that people understand. How many people write about these things to the popular press? How many people have uh, produced manuals or videos that are useful for this. Uh, there are very little for the common person interested in nature to understand what these things mean. So again, the pressure has to come from people wanting to learn and pressure has to come from those who know how to explain it. Some things may be too complicated to explain in a popular journal. For the most part, the basic field techniques can easily be explained. What about our values as a, as a country? Uh, we once had a rich cultural ethos of conservation which seems to have largely vanished. I would, I would pose it slightly differently. We, the Hindu culture is very old. It's the last surviving polytheistic religion. So it evolved at a time when human beings didn't have so much control over nature. So. Uh, you know, attributes of divinity are given to animals, to birds. So it's kind of deeply ingrained in the religion. It also views human being as a part of a more complicated natural system, which is actually a scientific view in some sense. So what that says is everything was not created for human beings. Human being is a part of a more complex uh, system. and. The tolerance part comes from that uh, and I think it gives us a very strong advantage in setting up a modern conservation system. In this modern world, we need proper science-based conservation, but this tolerance that still survives uh, amazingly provides a very good foundation for building modern conservation. So you often said that green posturing harms rather than helps conservation. What exactly do you mean by this and can you give us a few examples? Yeah, green posturing is in a sense, uh, in my view, you know, let's say there's a big hotel or a resort and it's turning a river away, using the resources, uh, wood for heating the evening campfire comes from the forest. But then you have some recyclable cup in your room or some little thing and you claim that you are green. Individuals do it too. You, we claim we are green because we cycle around in a green t-shirt in a city, you, you know, run for the tiger or do things of this kind. And often that's 
not helpful. It, in some cases, it could be harmful because you are projecting something that's false. The other way what I consider green posturing is, you know, uh, some forms of energy production like wind power or solar power or mini and micro hydro dams, these claim to be green automatically. We don't need any certification, we don't need any scrutiny because we are green by definition. I don't think so. Many of these projects are doing far more harm often than big projects are doing. So the green posturing comes in very many ways. So you have to really look closely to see what is green posturing and what is not. It's not apparent on the surface. So going forward, so what would be the formula for successful conservation according to you? I don't think there's a simple formula, uh, but I would say that today if conservation, by which term I mean saving remnants of nature, wildlands and wildlife, I mean specifically that, if that is the goal, we have to somehow make sure that the economic progress and development that people are demanding does not come at the cost of nature. Uh, we cannot say people should not demand technological progress or economic development. I think that's unrealistic. So we have to recognize that it needs to happen, but it needs to happen in a smart way so that nature is least affected. And to me that means you have to look at science and technology for solutions rather than take a Luddite attitude and say we don't need science and technology, we just have to revert to some past. Now I think these are the two key things, one is science and technology are solutions to some of the problems which have been created by development. Therefore balancing development with conservation has to be science based. Right, thank you so much for speaking to us.